So the majority of the time when we're kids, we have a dream of being in the limelight in some shape or form. Some of us want to be on the big screen. Some of us want to be in hit TV shows. Others want to be sports athletes so that all eyes are on us all the time. Well, I'm talking to somebody today who fulfilled that childhood dream. He was on the hit Australian TV show, Big Brother season 14, when he made it to the final three. If you live in Australia, you've probably seen him walking in the streets of Fairfield doing his man on the street interviews. And then if you've been to an Assyrian party or an event, he's probably emceed or hosted it. Mr. Johnson Ashek, thank you so much for making the time, man. How's everything going with you? Thank you so much for having me, mate. What an introduction that was. I usually introduce people, but that was fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm glad you reached out. And uh, I think this is uh, this is the definition of Mr. Worldwide over here. So I'm glad that we are, although in different continents, we're reaching out and and uh, keeping keeping us real. Absolutely. And that's actually something, one thing that I want to touch upon in our conversation today. So just to set the expectations for the audience, what I want to do first is I'm going to talk about the bit of your life and then transitioning to your biggest influences and then how it was having millions of eyeballs on you per day uh, whenever your TV show was airing and then transitioning from social media into then talking about Assyrians to the American communities versus the Australian Assyrians to see if the problems that we're facing in those regions of the world are same, if all our problems are cultural or regional specific. So I'm interested in the Assyrian life in the communities over there, down under in the world where you're at. So first of all, um, you're currently 28 years old, I believe. I am. And so when the hit, when the TV show started, you must have been 25, 26 years old, if I'm correct, uh, that timeline between recording and then getting the show published on air. You're a young man at that time. Having a lot of eyeballs on you is a very scary thing. Millions of eyeballs on you per week. And so in my life, a majority of Syrian men have a great influence on themselves, someone who's bestowing wisdom upon them. That for me was my dad. The greatest piece of advice my dad ever told me was, son, the only thing in life that's free is advice. You like it, take it. You don't like it, leave it, but always listen. So I always listened to that my whole entire life. When you were going into this TV show, knowing that there's going to be a lot of pressure on you, there's going to be a prize of a lot of money at the end of it that you could win that could change your life. Was there somebody in your ear talking to you saying like, Johnson, listen, you got to block out this noise or take this piece of advice. Who was that person in your life? Great question. Uh, look, for me, it was a, uh, I guess before going on the show and being a Syrian, it's not easy. Before going on the show, I asked my parents three times whether or not they wanted me to go on. I know it was a journey that I was about to face physically, emotionally, spiritually, and the likes, but my parents go to church. My parents work uh, in hospitality and uh, through the government, and they would have experienced similar um, expectations and pressures and people seeing them. So I gave them the opportunity. They raised me for 25, 26 years. They have every right to have a say in my life and what I do, so long as I live under their roof. So for me, I asked my parents three times. At that time, um, we were, or the world was going through COVID. So for me, I never got to see them face to face. I could only speak to them over the phone because I was working roughly 150 kilometers uh, south of Sydney, which is a far, far, which is far. So for me, I, I had to ask them to get to get permission from them. I asked them three times and all three times they said, Bronny, please, this is something that you've always wanted to do. Um, we know the type of person and character you are. You're not going to compromise, jeopardize, or in any way, shape or form, uh, diminish who you are as a person, so long as you hold the values that we've taught you. Perfect, fantastic, thank you very much. In the house, I took a handful of photos in the house with me. I was in the house for about two and a half months. Uh, no contact with the outside world, no phones, no communication. So for me, uh, those photos were my family. We had taken throughout our lifetime, which were at pivotal points in our life. My, bro my brother's 21st birthday, my graduation and the likes. So for me, it was always my family in my ear, whether it was uh, face to face, over the phone, via FaceTime, or just looking at their photos in the house and being like, yep, you got me, I got you. You know, getting on a TV show is not easy. And so 
I read a book recently called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, and I will be honest, I don't agree with everything said in the book, but it got me thinking about a lot of things. And the main premise of the book is that people such as Bill Gates had a lot of lucky opportunities in their life where that led them down a string of more opportunities, which led them to be one of the most successful, well-known people in the world. A lot of people that we know today who are extremely successful or have had great uh, resources of success and wealth and and knowledge and, and publicity had lucky breaks. That's the argument of the book. And so, you know, considering your life, being on a person who was selected on a TV show where only a few people were selected on, where you can have the opportunity to win a really big prize. And then, you know, when you're on TV shows and on the big screen, you automatically get a lot more credibility in terms of the public eye because they're like, oh, this person was selected. He can entertain. He can do these amazing things on the big screen. And you, again, you're living through that childhood experiences other people are not able to experience themselves, but imagine when they were younger. So do you feel that you were lucky and that you got this opportunity and that led you down like now social media transitioning we have a big social media following and now you that opened up doors for you to MC and host events or no was this more of a no this is a divine blessing from god i took advantage of the opportunities before me and i worked really hard to get to where i am today it has nothing to do with luck i don't believe in luck i believe in blessings for me it was a blessing there was 21 people in the big brother house 21 people of the 21 people that were in the Big Brother house at any point in time, through the doors and out the doors, there was 13 new housemates. Australia's population is 26 to 27 million. I was one of 13 who got selected of the 27 million. Not everyone auditioned, evidently, but um, I don't think of it as a, I don't, I don't believe in luck. I believe in God's path. I believe in a blessing. Now, for me, I've always been uh, comfortable speaking in public. I've always been comfortable in the public eye. I've always been pub uh, comfortable uh, on a stage. So for me, I always knew uh, that I had something that I could give back to not only my friends, family, but also the world. By trade, I went to university. I finished first class honors with a civil structural engineering degree. Uh, for life, I build bridges. That's my full-time job. And I've also got a Bachelor of Business majoring in finance. That I don't believe is my calling in life. I believe that I have uh, this charisma that where I can bring people together, where I can entertain, where I can um, collaborate, share my joys and happiness. So for me, when I started on the show and I got selected, I was like, damn, like that. this is, I actually didn't believe it. To be honest, I had no idea. I actually auditioned um, as a joke, like not as a joke, but I, but I auditioned where I was like, hey, there's so many people in the world. How am I going to get in? As if they're going to want a guy with one eyebrow and a receding hairline at the time. As if they're going to want that. And there I was the next day. They gave the guy with the one eyebrow and a receding hairline a phone call. And for me, it, cha it, 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 cha it did change my life. I became... I became Johnson, who worked as a civil structural engineer, building bridges for Transport for New South Wales as a company, moving through to uh, jo uh, Johnson on Big Brother. Then I went on to become the guy from TikTok, uh, the guy who MCs, the guy who hosts. So I was going to say those opportunities that arose right now, you're hosting parties. Now you're at these events where people are listening to you speak. You're introducing people of you know status. You yourself have accumulated some status because of the, the public recognition. So has that been something because of the show or do you think that you would have inevitably gotten to that point regardless of that opportunity? No way. The most followers I had on Instagram was like 1500 to 2000 at best. I mean, in the Eastern suburbs community here in Sydney, uh, growing up, I worked a handful of places and I went to, like, I went to school at the local community. I, I was quite involved with the local community, but never did I ever think that I was going to hit 22,000 followers on Instagram with a following uh, that, that reached not only Australia, but also the world. Uh, so to answer your question in a nutshell, the answer is no, I never thought that. I was, in, I was only in Florence about six months ago and I was catching a train from Rome to Florence or Florence to Venice, one or the other. And some guy from Canada pulled me up and he was like, hang on. And I was like, oh, here we go. I'm either, I'm either about to get pickpocketed or I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to throw some hands as they say in Sydney. Uh, and he goes to me and he goes, Hey mate, you're, I was like, yeah. And he was like, you're the guy from big brother. You're Johnson. Right. And I was like, you're Canadian. How do you know me? He's like, mate in Canada, we love the Australian big brother. So for me, that opportunity, that's one example of so many. 
that I would have never been able to experience had it not been for the show. This thing that you need to do, it's called perform. You need to perform because if you're entertaining, they don't vote you off the show. If you're entertaining, they keep you longer. If you're entertaining, you gain a following. If you're, there's so many benefits of being entertaining. If you're a boring character with no good backstory, with nothing to fight for, you're most likely going to get booted off the show early on. That's not just in Big Brother. That's in the majority of reality TV shows. So was there a pressure on you to perform at a high level, also a bit of theatrics where you need to be a little bit more explosive and making sure that you know, the TV show needs to have a reason to keep me on and then also keeping your eye on the prize and performing and doing the challenges correctly and also making sure you don't step on the wrong people's toes. There's a lot of strategy that people don't understand. It's just like, oh no, this person is acting uh, in accordance to how the show is supposed to be. But in your mind, you're like, no, I'm trying to win and also make sure I don't get kicked off the show. How much strategy are you keeping in mind when you're on these TV shows? Or are you just being yourself pretending there's no cameras around? Before walking into the Big Brother house, one of the producers, so we were, we were isolated for 10 days during COVID. We were isolated for 10 days before walking into the Big Brother house. Before walking into the house, they sat you down. They were like, okay, who is Johnson? And I was like, I'm really nervous. What do I talk about? I'm actually like, I'm actually a really cool person, but how do I explain myself to someone who doesn't know me? Uh, and I was, I answered, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm an engineer. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm smart. I, sometimes I'm funny. And I got really nervous. And I was like, hang on, I'm just going to relax and be me. Before walking into the house, I gave myself three objectives to achieve. Um, and we had to write them down before walking in there. My first one was not to compromise who I was as a person not to compromise who, I, who, who my belief systems were as a person. My parents taught me loyalty, I was loyal. My parents told me, or my family and the people around me taught me uh, to be authentic and to be yourself and to show emotion, which is the sort of person I am, if you know me. I mean, I'm quite expressive with my facial expressions uh, and my change of tone. That's the sort of person I am. So theatrics, uh, the expectation on the show to keep uh, uh, to be in there, to play the game. The way I like to explain it is, this is very similar to Survivor. So the style of the Australian Big Brother has shifted to a Survivor style whereby the Survivor show, you go in there, you play games or you, or you have challenges, you win the challenge, you verse each other, you nominate, you create alliances and you kick people off the show. When you make it to the end, like I did, Australia votes. In that style, unfortunately at the time, I wasn't as physically apt or as strong or as fit or as... I couldn't hold myself up for three hours like the other guys. So I worked on my biggest strength, which was my personality and my ability to strategize. That was very clear from the get go. I think uh, people knew that I wasn't going to be a threat physically in the house, but strategically and being able to play the game, that was my strength. Theatrics, uh, theatrics and uh, putting it on, as they say, you're putting it on. Uh, in Aussie terms, we say, bro, you're putting it on, put it on, which is putting it on. Uh, to summarize it for you, no. Every emotion I felt in the house was raw. Every emotion that you saw was raw. Uh, every uh, tear, every rage, every uh, argument and disagreement that I had, that was raw because that is me to a T. So those who know me can absolutely stand next to me hand, um, hand on heart and say that is exactly who Johnson is. Like you're there to entertain. You are there to entertain. Um <laughs> And unfortunately, if you don't entertain, you don't get camera time. And uh, me being who I was got camera time naturally because of the person who I was. How hard did you take the loss? Was it something that ate away at you after, you know, you went home, you sat in bed that night, and then you looked into the, the photo camera on your phone, looking at the memories, man, what could have been, what could have been? Or was it something like, you know what, I'm just going to find something else that fills this, this void that I was in this house for like over 20, you know, over two months. And uh, we're going to move on. It's not going to bother me. How did you take it? I'm not going to sit here and pretend like it didn't bother me. Uh, it bothered me for about a year after the finale. And being a Middle Eastern Assyrian man, we don't deal with emotion. We're taught to not deal with emotion, put it to the side and move on through life. We don't talk about how we feel. Unfortunately, that's the stigma. I went back to work the week after the loss and I never had time to sit back and really... Uh, pull apart what this had done to me. I really just let it sit on the back burner for the first six months until really Christmas of 2022, uh, where I really started to work on myself and say, hey, look, again, in the similar way that God gave you this opportunity to be on Big Brother, he gave you the same opportunity to win 
and it's in his writings, it's in his book for you to, uh, to come second. It's not in his script for you to win because you're going to win in other avenues. That was a philosophy that I had in my head. Um, and that's, that's what pushed me to get out of that rut. Um, it, was, it was so difficult because the person who, who had run, Reggie, beautiful person, right, actually sat opposite me before the show and she looked at me and she goes, Johnson, I don't know how to tell you this. I've won Big Brother before. So she had won in 2003. When she looked at me and she goes, Johnson, you know, I'm the queen of Big Brother. Uh, I've won it before. You've won this season. People look at you and go, I want to play that game. And for me, that that to me was like, damn, I've done it. You know, the fact that, you know, a past housemate who has won the show before can look at me and go, he's, he's, he's won the hearts of the Australian public and he's won the minds and he played such an incredible game. That was my W, as they say. I mean, it comes up as memories in, um, in my socials. It comes up in public. People bring it up when they see me. Oh, it's the guy from Big Brother. You know, uh, did it hit me hard? Hell yeah. But male Assyrians being male Assyrians or being males in general, we don't talk about how we feel. We don't talk about dissecting your emotions and really coming to terms with the fact that, no, I was broken, man. I was gutted. I was broken. I was shattered. I can't explain to you. I was absolutely broken. Like my, my parents, you know, I, I came home the night after because we stayed in the hotel because we had to. Um, and I came home the next day and they just looked at me and they were like, like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you do. You're still a winner in our eyes. I mean, the fact that you made it so far uh, and, and, and to finish where you did. So blessing in disguise. I, I, I mean, that was, that was the mantra that I had to tell myself, you know, that was the mantra that I had to tell myself, this is a blessing in disguise or else it would have continued to eat me alive, man. It would have absolutely continued to eat me alive, but God's blessing, God's will. Some people self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of success. And what that means is that once they see an opportunity before them, they will detract that rail somehow. They'll either not show up to, for example, an interview. Once they land an interview, they will not show up to a job opportunity once the job opportunity is presented to itself. You took that opportunity, you made it to the final three, and like you said, it was out of your hands at that point. You did everything that you could. But there's one thing, you are putting yourself out there for the world to see, right? And that's something that's very difficult for a lot of people to do. A lot of people like to hide behind their phones under a fake profile picture, maybe a fake username. They don't like to put themselves out there because they're afraid to lose a job or they're afraid to, whatever the reason is, there's a million reasons why everyone can speculate why people are Twitter fingers and nobody's really about putting their face out there. They're afraid of criticism. They're afraid of a million eyeballs on them. And so some, there's, that's also a form of self-sabotage in my opinion. But uh, regardless of that, you went on the show knowing there was a possibility to lose. Also, in the Middle Eastern cultures, specifically Assyrian cultures, because we'll, we'll stick to Assyrian cultures since we're both Assyrian men, um, gossip is a huge part of the community. A lot of people talk. So were you ever worried and concerned about the people that you love or people that you knew were going to speak ill about you? Oh, look at this guy. He didn't win. He didn't make it to the, to the, he didn't win the cash prize that could have whatever with his family. Was that ever on, the, on your mind or were you like, I'm doing this for my family. I don't care about what any, any, anyone else says. This is, this is for me and only for me. Yeah. Great cue. Great question. Going on any form of reality TV, you have to be, you've got to be sturdy. You've got to be a rock. You've got to be very comfortable with who you are as a person. Uh, you can't go on any form of reality TV because you get picked apart. Your intentions get questioned um, your motives get pulled apart. Uh, the reason why you went on the show and of course the result that all gets picked apart. For me, I couldn't give a shit what people had to say. I had more people blowing me up on Instagram. The fact that I was a Middle Eastern male on a TV show where I was in Australia. I copped a whole lot of racism on TV being on TV, being the way that I look. Um, so I didn't, I didn't have to worry about um, what people have to say um, in our, unfortunately, in our um, Assyrian community. I must say my biggest supporting group was the Assyrian community. My biggest supporting network was the Assyrian community. The biggest you know, uh, team that I had supporting me, aside from my family and, and close friends, was the Assyrian community. So I actually can't say anything bad about the Assyrian community. They were there for me the whole time. It was the others that love to see someone who looks like me fail, someone who looks like me not do well, someone who looks like me say and do what I said or cry. So for me, I put all that in the or all that behind me and just said, hey, look, I've got to focus on what's important for me. This is 250,000 tax-free Australian dollars. 
Half of it was going to my brother, which is important to me because if I win, he wins. And when we win as a family, we've got to share. That's something that I've been, that's something that I've been taught. Uh, so, I mean, for me, it would have been 125000 to my brother the same. But that's what, I, that's what I wanted to achieve. That's what I wanted. I wanted that W. Uh, and what people had to say, bro, that was uh, unfortunately what people had to say that was next to what um, or as low as the belly of a snake. I, I, I couldn't care what they had to say. What you said about the Assyrian community is absolutely 100% true. I would not be talking to you today if I did not have the support of my own community. They're the reason why I've made it so far as well. So I completely understand that sentiment. I fully agree with you. That's the beautiful thing about being a Syrian. Yeah. Um, but transitioning a bit. So you actually mentioned something that I wanted to talk about. You said that you experienced a bout of racism and on your man in the street videos, you actually have some questions where you go up to strangers in Fairfield and you ask them, um, is Australia racist? Have you experienced racism? You actually asked this question publicly before to strangers uh, on the street. And so it sounds like Australia has a racism problem, but to be completely honest with you in America, I've never experienced racism once or discrimination once in my entire life. And I happen to live in a place where it's very diverse. Mm -hmm. But, you know, back in the day, used to not be. There used to not be people that look like me here. That's why I think America is the greatest country in the world, because even with all of the things that you hear in the news and the propaganda on the social media and all these things, you don't experience it anecdotally. And so I just wanted to share that sentiment with you about being an American, a Syrian, and, and, and where I live today. But can you tell me what you mean exactly about racism? Why do you ask these questions? Is, is Australia a racist country? Can you dive into deep on that for me? Yeah. So, uh, look, Australia... Australia was settled. So prior to the British or the English coming to this country and uh, or, 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 or recognising it as a state without occupation effectively, which is the term terra nullius that we use, before occupation there was the Indigenous Aboriginals. And similar to us Assyrians who, were, who are Indigenous to portions of the Middle East, there is a level of respect that Assyrian Indigenous people must have to the um, Aboriginal Australian Indigenous. For me, it's important that I raise this topic because I live in a suburb or in a city where it is quite uh, dominated by Anglo-Saxons, by typically white Australians. And in, in this city or in this suburb, no one actually, well, there's not many people that look like me. So growing up, going to school, I was the Arab. Going to school, there were jokes about bombs. There was jokes about guns. Now, whether you like it, whether it's a joke or it's not, it's still racist. You're, 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 you're parting or you're being partial towards a person based on their race. So whether it's direct or indirect, whether it's malicious or joking, there are forms of racism. A perfect example, there was, a, a, it would have been 15 to 20 years ago, in South, uh, in South Sydney or in South of uh, Sydney, there was what was what was known then as the Cronulla riots. Cronulla is another city or another suburb that is heavily dominated with Anglo-Saxons, and unfortunately, there was a difference in opinion on how uh, some male or female was treated by another form of a Lebanese member in the community. Now, I'm talking racism for Assyrians. I'm talking racism across the board. There was a huge divide at that time 15 to 20 years ago where there was fist fights cars being blown up cars being trod on police officers being bashed because of race so when we talk about australia being a racist country when when people say to me no australia is not a racist country you may not have experienced racism but it, i mean you look back at our history and you can't say that australia to date is not a racist country and I want to talk about, you know, you have the American Indians and I don't know too much about the American Indians and their history in America, but I don't, you know, that's something that I, I'm not too familiar with, but I would like, it will be interesting for you to ask people of indigenous nature to your country and to see what their perspective would be. Because for me, we've just gone through the yes, no, refer, uh, yes, no referendum, the voice vote. And the, the majority of Australians voted no to this referendum, whereby the Indigenous Australians were going to have a voice in Parliament. 65% of Australians said no. If you look at my poll on Instagram, 60 plus percent said no. What is it? Is it a lack of information? Is it, what is it? What, what is still causing this divide? Is there a divide? In my eyes, yes, there is. 
Uh, I experienced racism on the show. I experienced racism now in Australia. It's definitely a lot more settled. It's a definitely a lot more multicultural. Australia is a beautiful country. This is this is my this is my land. This is my home. Um, I was born in this country. I was bred in this country. This is my country. And when people say to me, "Go back to where you came from, bro," this is where I was born and bred, and my background and my culture is Assyrian. So Australia being Australia, um, man, if you take a look at the most recent um, Australian census, you'll look at the different types of religions, you'll, you'll look at the different types of cultures in this country. It's definitely moving away from the white Australia policy that we once had. You touched about being born and raised in Australia and you're an Australian. How would your life be shaped differently if you were, let's say, your parents decided to go to America or London or Canada instead of the heavily populated areas of Australia? Those are the other diaspora locations in which Assyrians are heavily populated in. So what happened if you were moving in those directions instead of where you were born and raised? I probably wouldn't be using the word mate as frequently. Uh, it would probably be lad. Right. Lad. Or dude, <laughs> I don't know what they use in the states yeah. <laughs> or, or, or the UK. Right, right. But um, I don't think my path would be too different because your because your home is where you're brought up, right? Your home is who you are. And I mean, I mean, credit to credit to mum and dad, it, it, Sargon and Janet. They they have they've built a home where respect. I think regardless of where we ended up, you know, um, would have been the same. Had my path been different, probably. They say you're a byproduct of your surroundings. I'm a byproduct of my direct surroundings in my house, right? It, it, uh, like it may have been different. It, say I would have been brought up in um, Melbourne or Tennessee or London or what have you. Uh, but I do think it's quite uh, heavily concentrated and uh, reflected on your family home. Who are some negative and positive influences on your life besides your, your mom and dad? I know you're a very heavy family man. So your brother, you care for him. I know he has a very, you know, a sentimental backstory to him that you, you care greatly for him. And, and there was a, you know, cancer struck the family. And that's why, you know, it touches a special place in your heart. Your mom, your dad, you want to take care of them. Who outside of your family was someone in your life that you really appreciate their, their words of wisdom to you, or maybe even a bad influence that you were like, you know what, they laid the blueprint on life on what not to follow. Let me not follow that person's steps. Who are those good and bad influences? That's a great question. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, the bad. I'm going to start with the bad and then move into the good because the bad's always easy. The good's always hard because you've got to pop them up. Uh, there was a couple of people in my life that I think, um, and unfortunately, uh, with with responsibility and with a stage and with a platform, you get jealousy. You get all forms of jealousy. And I'm sure you would be experiencing the same thing. I mean, you've got an incredible podcast. You've got an incredible platform that you use to, to spread the love and word of uh, the Assyrian community. And in the same fashion, unfortunately, you're going to have haters. Haters that you wouldn't have expected. Family, friends, uh, and, and cousins. That happens. So th there, was, there was a handful of people at my work that because because I, I, I'd taken time off and I went straight back to work, didn't want me to do well, really wanted me to fail. Family, friends were supportive to my face, whether they weren't supportive to my face or not, and they were talking uh, behind my back and saying all sorts of things. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt they weren't, or they were. I absolutely believe, you know, I hope that they weren't because I'm a person who tries to encourage and, and, and promote whatever it is that people want to do in their life. So I hope that they didn't. Uh, but I, I can I can almost guarantee they would have. Now, good people in my life. Uh, I've got a very supportive uh, partner in my life. She's incredible. She's um, she's 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 really really supportive. She's been supportive from the get go. Um, I've also got uh, incredible friends in my life who, without them, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. But there's one guy who I used to uh, work for. I used to work at a gym at a receptionist and um, scam people through the gym. And uh, he sat me down just before the show went live, like literally the day before. And he was like, have you written down what you want to achieve? Have you written down where you want to be in five years? Have you written down a product that you think that may be huge for yourself? Have you written down and thought about where you want to be in you know, six months time or a year's time? Because you know, this wave only goes for six to nine months. And I was like, whoa, you're right. I didn't, I, like I never thought of that. For me, it was like, I can't wait for the, for the show to start. And, you know, all the other housemates were like gearing up with their next podcast and gearing up with the next this and that and the other. And I was like, yeah, I can't wait to win. Yeah. Right. I was naive. 
I was almost ignorant in a way, right? Uh, but he sat me down and, and credit to him because he really, you know, stood out to, I guess, the, um, the, the supporting crowd. He was, he was definitely someone that said to me, hey, look, you've really got to hone in on, on, on your niche and, and your niche is uh, who you are. Don't try and be anyone else. And I was like, well, you're about to see that I was myself the whole time on the show. So fortunately for me, uh, he, he caught me early and he said all the important things that he needed to say to me for me to be where I am today. So thank you. I asked that question because a lot of people be like, Emmanuel, you've asked this question so many times. Why do you care what people are saying behind your back? Why do you keep caring what people are going to say? Because this is something that's on the back of everybody's mind before they do something that could potentially change their life. Because we're human beings. We are designed to be defensive for our survival. And that means to make sure that we don't get any emotional or mental damage to us. So words could cause that for a lot of people. You don't want to be outcasted and it's because you want to stay within the group, the camp, the society, so that you feel more safer, more secure. But I'm telling you that people like Johnson and others who I've spoken to in the past all have faced some similar things where they know for a fact that people are going to be speaking, but you need to put your blinders up and you need to keep going. Uh, it's just a reality of life. And if you want to hide under a rock your whole entire life, you you know feel free to do so. But unfortunately, that's going to be the limitations of which... God is going to be able to take you. He can't take you on an adventure too far outside of that little nice four wall bedroom of yours. Just like Abraham in the Bible, he told them, listen, you got to leave or and go out and have your, your life's journey. And then look what happened to the rest of the world. The rest is history. So transitioning a bit more, um, starting your life in uni, uh, you guys call it uni. Yeah. I like calling it university just to be in the middle of, of the two worlds. Yeah. But you first started off as a person who uh, hated university. You wanted to drop out. You ended up switching to engineering and you found your love uh, in your career of like how you said before, you're a civil engineer building bridges. But you also would have, you've mentioned this publicly, wanted to be a teacher if engineering wasn't for you. And you have that personality to be a teacher. But being a personality to be a teacher is because you can, you know, have conversations with other people, socialize with other people. You're, you're, you're a extrovert, I would say, um, on the outside. I would say I'm extroverted uh, by force. I'm a naturally <laughs> introverted person, but there's times where I have to pull myself out there and be out there. I don't know if that's how it is for you. If you're naturally extroverted, we can talk about that. But essentially now, like how we were saying, you're transitioning your career to the social media side, being that person that's bigger than just Johnson, the, the, the no name architect or in, in civil engineer building bridges. Now you want to be a person who has a calling, a passion. you want to fulfill that. So how do you see yourself transitioning into the social media realm? And what do you plan on doing with that? What are some goals that you have? What are some things that you have working on right now that you can tell me? That's a good question. I, off, I mean, I live five minutes from the beach. I often reflect on this question very, very often. And nine times out of 10, I end up thinking about something completely different. People who don't know me, typically with uh, the sort of character I am, with the sort of person that I look like, with what I say and do, might look like someone who is uh, self-oriented, self-absorbed, and unfortunately, uh, selfish. People who know me know I'm the complete opposite. And this is me being like real. Like I don't want to talk about, I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, pump myself up. But those people who actually know me, I'm quite a giving person. So for me, my calling in life is to give back. And in the construction industry or in the civil engineering industry, it's very hard to give back. And it's hard to, I mean, you, you design these incredible bridges, you go out there, you build them. But in the meantime, you're working tirelessly, you're working your ass off. And I feel like I'm not really reaping the reward or like what I'm uh, like what I'm uh, uh, breeding is not what I want to achieve or want to achieve. Where I feel like teaching from the get go, I started with law. I started with law at University of South Wales and I hated it. I hate it. I was like, dad, mom. I'm not made for university. I did so well at school. What do I do now? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna go be a builder with my brother. I'm gonna go labor. I was gonna go and I was so I was laboring at the time. I was like, man, I can't do this. But I was like, man, chill out, relax. Nihabroni. Mm. Should have like just chill out. Take a deep breath. What are you good at? Like, what are you good at? Well, I was like, Dad, I'm I'm, you know, I'm great at this. I'm gonna move into something that you might enjoy. So I moved into engineering and business, and I loved it. Smashed it out of the park and. I do what I do now. But for me, I still feel like I need to give back. I still feel like I don't have the runs on the board or the home runs, if you want to keep it in, um, in the American context. Like, I feel like I, don't, I haven't achieved what I want to achieve yet. 
that's a personal issue that I have because I keep myself to account and I challenge myself every day. You know, I want a dollar, I want two. I want to I want to help this person, I want to help that person. That's the sort of person I am. And I feel like if I do go into teaching or I do move into a form of teaching, it might like I might be like, okay, cool, I've done that. What's next? And so I feel as though that I'm I'm reaping that benefit from my social media. And I and I actually reflected on that about two to three weeks ago where I was like, okay, I may not be sitting in front of a classroom and teaching calculus, or I may not be, you know, uh, in a in a lecture um, teaching structural design for uh, for engineers and architects. But instead, I'm teaching the world who I am, where we came from, what we do, our history. To me, that's the biggest, that is one of the biggest teachings that I can give back. So I actually found... Do you think that could be a dead end? Yeah, absolutely. It can be a dead end, particularly with, uh, particularly with the saturated market. You feel like you may not be able to do so. Um, but I think with the way that I've carried out my life, I think regardless of what I do, I'll get to a dead end. That's just the person I am. I might get to, you know, three, four years down the track and be like, okay, well, I need to explore. Uh, I need to get back on TV somehow because I need to, I need to, I need to expand the audience again. I need to expand the audience again. I need to be more influential. I need to, where does it end? And unfortunately that's the sort of person I am. It's a, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, but I, I, I started very small and I started with teaching the people in my classroom who Assyrians were, putting the name out there, reminding Assyrians that we are, uh, we've actually got a number, a plethora of very strong, switched on people who have the ability to communicate in an effective manner and do so respectfully without compromising their position, you know, uh, their beliefs. I have a best friend of mine. I taught him about Assyrians a few years ago. He's a white boy in the mountains of Utah. And now he teaches everybody else who Assyrians are on my behalf. Yeah. So I fully understand what you're saying in that regard. When it comes to public speaking and communication, as you just alluded to, that is a skill. It is a skill that is needed to either be tamed and redirected and, you know, organize your thoughts and be able to go and give that presentation, that speech, that announcement in front of a group of people, because it's a scary thing that a lot of many people fear. Public speaking is one of the biggest phobias that Americans fear. I don't know about the rest of the world, but specifically in America, it is something that is one of the biggest fears. With you, were you ever afraid of public speaking? Were you ever that person that would have the shaky legs and the, and the uh, sweaty arms and going into the assignment stuttering and worried about what people are gonna say, think and say about them? Or no, was it kind of more of a natural thing for you and it goes along with the personality that you have absolutely natural absolutely natural it is you know some people are blessed with artistic uh, elements others can jump in a in an ma ring and be and be beaten and bashed for f five five minute rounds or five three minute rounds um others can fly planes i, I think i was blessed with uh the charisma and the confidence to not be shaken or stirred in a public forum. Growing up, I did debating, mock trial, and public speaking through primary school from pretty much 10 years old. Uh, when I got to high school, I did debating and public speaking. I got to year 12, I was the school captain or the college captain when I was in year 12 of the senior year. Being, you know, being someone who looked like me in a white, do in a white school, in a white dominated school, that was weird, that was different. Right. Um, but it didn't phase me. I'm not going to stand here and pretend like, you know, when I'm hosting Ramina Rated or I'm hosting the Assyrian New Year coming up or I'm hosting weddings and, and functions and comedy shows and launches and the likes that you don't get nervous because you do. And it's a natural physiological response to you becoming nervous. You tighten up, your breath shortens. But I've worked out ways on how to uh, relax myself and it, and it comes through breathing. And I actually learned how to do that through a mental health first aid course that I did about four years ago, where it was breathing is your regulator. And on one extreme, you have fight, you either fight the fight or you fly and you fly away and you, and, and you run, you either, you know, it's fight versus flight. And your, 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 your physiological uh, response uh, is regulated by your breathing. And for me, it's breathing is, is, is so important, particularly when I'm about to get up in front of, 
15, 20,000 people, let alone the Big Brother live finale where you walk out and, I mean, I posted a story the day of, of the finale, and it got almost half a million views on my Instagram story. So I was thinking to myself, okay, so we've got a half million views on my Instagram story and I'm just about to walk out on stage. And I could win. And so for me, like like you said, um, is, it, is it something that you that you take and you grow on? Absolutely. Um, as I mature, as I go through you know, my, my late 20s and I'll go into my 30s and whatnot, the types of events that I'll host and MC are going to vary. Um, but nonetheless, this is all natural. And I think that goes hand in hand with my um, initial answer where I said everything that you saw on Big Brother was all natural, was all real, was all me. A lot of people, when they see videos like this, they assume that, you know, there's no fear whatsoever. There's no nervousness. There's a fine line between anxiety and uh, excitement. And so when I'm having these conversations, I'm excited to have these conversations. When I have done 22 interviews, you're my 22nd one as of right now, um, I'm not nervous initially the same way that I would have been in my first one, but there's still that bit of excitement in me that kicks in right before the conversation starts. So a lot of people, I would argue, are more excited than they are anxious. I would say that you are not anxious. You're excited to be in front of these people, to talk in front of these people. You just need to organize your thoughts clearly and effectively and making sure you know what you're going to be coming into, essentially be prepared for what's ahead of you. And then all that anxiety goes away. So I think preparation is a big thing that goes with it. I agree with you that breathing is a huge aspect of it. There's a trick that I learned in a book recently where you take a deep breath in for three seconds and then exhale for six seconds and that really calms your heartbeat down and then that you're able to then focus more i always say do not make a decision in fight or flight when you're in fight or flight your body wants to your adrenaline's kicking you're you're trying to freak out your body's trying to recalibrate itself to best chances of survival but when you ask yourself questions during fight or flight all of a sudden your blood the adrenaline is redirected to your brain and you're able to think clearly so the next time that you're in a fight or flight situation ask yourself the hard questions before you make a decision in action and all of a sudden your brain gets a kick of dopamine and adrenaline and you can think more clearly through and what your next moves are going to be so transitioning a bit more one of the biggest issues i see um, in the Assyrian community versus America and Australia. This is something that I want to really dive into with you today because I think it's a very important thing. But first, I want to preface with this. The reason why we bring up the bad is not to discredit our community. It is not to put our community down. Matter of fact, it does the complete opposite if done correctly. And to be sure that everyone's on the same page, this is why. You need to lay out why you're giving these messages and why having these conversations so that then everyone's on the same page. So first and foremost, when you bring up the bad things, I think it's a good idea first to bring up the good things. And before we bring up the good and bad things, let's continue on with why bringing up the bad is all right. In order to solve problems in today's community, you must know what the problems are. And in order to know the problems are, you must dissect them, bring to light out, quote unquote, all the dirty laundry. Oh, Emmanuel, why are you bringing out all the dirty laundry? There was so much criticism for George Janko, Patrick but David, Marmati Emmanuel, and Vincent O'Shawn on the PBD podcast when they were on talking about Assyrian issues. Oh, why were they bringing out Assyrian issues? Why were they talking about them? Why were they airing out our dirty laundry? Listen, you can't come to a solution for a problem without first acknowledging that there is a problem in the first place. Some of the great things Assyrians do in today's community is that we are some of the best people to ever be a part of a community for. We keep our streets clean. We're the best neighbors. We're extremely hospitable. We're good for our communities in terms of services. In, in Arizona specifically, I can speak to, we have a highway uh, cleanup crew where the Assyrians go and they volunteer their time and then we clean up our communities from the trash and all of the gutters and you know, highways and all of these things in the side streets. And then eventually one day we can get a road adopted and name it after us. In San Jose, there's, there's roads, I believe, called Assyria Street and Mardenja Street. So we, we're good for our communities. We're clean people. We're hospitable. We help our people. We donate back to our Atra. It's a lot of amazing aspects in the Assyrian community. And one of the best things is the support. Yes, there are people that talk trash. Yes, there are people that don't do the best in terms of communicating how they truly feel, because that's not how we are born. We were raised in an Arab country where that is the complete opposite of which way we're supposed to present ourselves. But I will say, we have a very supportive community, especially if you're doing good things. 
there's some there's amazing aspects of being part of an Assyrian community. And overall, I think that there's more good than bad. We just are bad at messaging and why we're messaging the bad things. So let's go through the bad things. Okay. With that said, I want to dive in specifically with relationships first. Is it hard for men in Australia, Syrian men specifically, to find a spouse out there who is also a Syrian or no? Is it more relatively easy? No, we don't live in, um, we don't live in bushland. Uh, we have churches. There's, there's, a, there's a plethora. There's uh, quite, an astounding num- quite an astounding number of, of Assyrians in the community. Um, we have, particularly in Sydney, uh, and I've done, I've, I've been to Melbourne a couple times, and I've seen the the community in Melbourne, but but Sydney definitely sets the tone. In Sydney, um, out west, there's quite a substantial number of Assyrians, and that's where the that's predominantly where our where our uh, cultural uh, city halls are, where our churches are. There's uh, members of parliament who are aware and target specifically the Assyrian community because they know that there are areas who are about to vote who are predominantly Assyrian. So to answer your question, it is, I, I mean, in my eyes, I think it's quite uh, straightforward. And uh, and look, if you're looking, I mean, <laughs> I mean, Tinder, Bumble, and all those sorts of uh, online apps, if that's what you're looking for, then so be it. But if to answer your question, if you're trying to find an Assyrian partner, I don't think it's too difficult to do so. Nonetheless, it's probably not as easy as the way that our parents have it. It's actually really it. interesting. Yeah, it's definitely not as easy as our parents have it, where it was like, um, right. You know, like it's definitely not as easy because I also feel like the expectation has changed. And because of that, the generational understanding and the expectation has changed. Well, let me, let me push back a bit on that mm-hmm. then. So what do you think every culture from the beginning of time, regardless of where you come from in the world, has a rite of passage mm-hmm for you to become a man or enter womanhood. What do you think that is in the Assyrian community? That's a good question. In the Assyrian community specifically, I think it's being present. I think that, uh, I think it's being present. And what I mean by being present, it's not like being holistic and, and, and the likes. I think it's being present. So um, being there for the Assyrian community, whether it be Assyrian New Year, going to churches and giving back to the Assyrian community. I feel like it's, it's, it's your devotion. It's your acts of service. I feel like that's, that's the metric that we use. I think in this day and age, particularly, and I see it, I see it. I mean, I'm a part of a, um, uh, I'm part of a youth group and in the youth group, unfortunately there's, there's guys and girls that struggle in there because their time, their time is, 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 uh, like their time in service for the community is quite low and they they still haven't developed that in their eyes, the rank. But I feel like even one second is, is important, is valuable, right? Others view it differently. And I feel like I, you're about to say something. I may have asked this question a bit indirectly, but what I was trying to get at is like, what is that thing that you must, like in the ancient times, it was kill a lion and you're a man, mm, right? Okay. What is it? the road of manhood or womanhood that you must do within our community that then sets you apart from being a child essentially oh. where like the elders will look at you and be like all right that's yeah. a that's a full grown person i think i think like great i love this so i'm going to take it back to the hunters versus gatherers so as a man we're hunters as a female you are gatherers right um as a well, typically that's that's who we are as humans that's how we've developed to who we are today now in assyrian culture i feel as though the hunter portion is putting food on the table, developing steady, consistent income, uh, going to church and teaching, you know, God's God's word, those things. In who we are today, if you're not like, if you're not a dentist, if you're not a doctor, if you're not um, a politician, if you're not an engineer, if you're not a lawyer, if you're not a prestigious uh member of the community or if your career doesn't entail something that went to university unfortunately still we have the stigma of you haven't completed what you need to complete and as a female i think it's i i think it's uh oh i mean i can't speak for the females in the room but i'd probably see it as something similar to be honest i'd actually you know i think in this day and age uh, women and females have the same expectations where they go out there, they go to university and they, you know, they achieve those incredible goals. And so they should. But in saying so, it's also the objective or the, the goal is also to procreate. 
because they're able to do so. So it's procreation and career. And then for males, it's putting the food on the table predominantly, but also teaching, you know, who we are. And I think that goes hand in hand. And that's why Assyrians um, are who we are today. That's- to me, I think it's marriage. Regardless of what age you are between your 20s and 30s, if you're not married, the, the older generation is going to look at you a certain way, right? They're going to be like, all right, you're not, you need to move out. You need to get into your own home. When are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? You know, like people at events would say like, Gayuma <laughs> Dioch or Dioch. Like they, they hype these things up. Yeah. It's very highly important for that generation in order to, you know, enter adulthood that's just how the older generation views things and i don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that but you do you think that sentiment needs to change would you agree with that would you agree that marriage is one of the rites of passage and that that's something that is heavily emphasized within our culture it's definitely something that's heavily emphasized in our culture i mean i have first cousins and second second cousins who are in their late 20s early 30s I mean, and in Western culture, that's considered just enjoying your life. When you go to when you go to weddings or you go to churches, it's considered ha male yen mala. Like, what's wrong with her? What's wrong with him? You know, um, it comes from a good family. But no, you're hundred percent. You are you are right when you say that. If you know, there's some person that's not married or they're not finding uh, that one person in their life, then uh, that's that's their that's their tick of approval with the family and the community. Is it the be all and end all? No, I don't think so. Like I, I mean, in my eyes, I'm, I'm quite, um, I'm quite open and understanding. I don't think so. I've got, I mean, I've got aunties and uncles who are in their fifties who are on their own and who are amazing people. That doesn't take away the fact they're able to provide and be incredible hunters as females or gatherers as men. Is it, is it, is it natural to, to find someone be, be monogamous and procreate? Probably. But am I okay with it? Yes. And that's the, that's what I'm trying to get to. That's exactly what I'm trying to get to. So what I'm trying to get to is this. In today's society, it is so much harder for a person to find someone to consider their significant other where they fully engage with. Like, it's so much harder than from our gener- our parents' generation age, as you so alluded to. It's like, as a child, you're like, oh, duh, mom and dad are both Assyrian. They got married. They had me. I'm Assyrian. It's as simple as that. But now, as you get older, you start to then, it's more complex view on life. You, 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 your parents, as a child, you view them as a wise supporter. But then as you get older, your parents are then a dominating and judgmental figure in your life when they try to point you in the right direction. So views of points change. You become more rebellious as we get older, especially in our teenage years where you're now understanding, oh, okay, maybe I don't want to marry an Assyrian person. Maybe there isn't an Assyrian person there for me. And then that's the way that society has drifted us, especially in America. I can't speak for Australia. That's why I'm asking you, but I'm talking specifically for America. So it's, oh, I don't want to listen to mom and dad anymore. I'll marry who I want to, when I want to, the way that I see fit, which to my perspective, that's the way that I handle it. I say I'm going to handle it the way that I want to. Don't interfere with my life. But there is kind of a nice thing about it where it's back in a generation where it was, oh, she's a Syrian. I'm a Syrian. It works for both of us. Let's get married. Continue this thing. Go and have a great time on the on the way there. But you, you choose a person that it makes sense for. So what, what I'm trying to get to mainly is the people in today's America, the Assyrian people, I've noticed that they are struggling greatly with finding a significant other who's also Assyrian. Is that the case in Australia or no? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, no, I don't think so. I think the expectations have changed and, and you hit the nail on the head. You, you absolutely hit the nail on the head when you said that, you know, mom's Assyrian, dad's Assyrian, I'm Assyrian. One plus one equals two. It's easy. I'll be honest with you. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube, all these social media uh, divisive mechanisms are there for very, very great reasons and purposes like we are having this discussion right now. But also they, they set unrealistic and unreasonable expectations for potentially someone who's seeing it for the first time. I mean, we look at, we look at, um, I mean, I know so many people in, in, in this, um, like on social media and platforms and I look at their relationship there, that they're showing, that they're showing the world, they're showing the world that he's going and he's getting her this and she's doing this and she's setting up this for him because he's very beautiful and they're hugging and kids. They've got this beautiful French bulldog who farts and shits all over the place. They've got this baby who's on the way and they're recording all the, 
But bro, believe me when I tell you, you have no idea when the camera is switched off what's happening. It sounds exactly like my house on a Friday night where Janet and Sargon are arguing it's normal. It, all this bullshit that people see on social media, it's not true. Believe me, I was on reality TV for God's sake. I've seen it. I've seen the real and I've seen the fake. So when you see, when you, you know, when you see the social media and you see, and, 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 and I am all for social media. I think it has, I think it has its place in society. I think it has very um, positive outcomes, but in the same way, it can be, it can set unrealistic and unreasonable and unfathomable expectations for those who are just, you know, coming through now. Your very tender years of, you know, 12, 13, 14, Man, my cousins have Instagram, Facebook, TikTok going through, oh, laughing at me. And then they're probably flicking through, you know, a, a husband and wife or a boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, kissing. For them, that's probably what they see. That's what that's what they're being exposed to in this in this day and age. So I say I say that with with all intent that social media has its place. I mean, heck, I use it. So I'm not going to sit here and bad mouth it one, but two. I'm I'm telling you, there's there's unreleased there's unreasonable expectations and um there's fake. So just be weary of the fake because there's plenty of that. So I understand what your perspective is. And that actually answers my question pretty well. So in Australia, it's not really a problem. But in America, I greatly do think and see that it is a problem. We have something called the American, uh, well, it's the Assyrian Youth Conference, where it's no longer American, really. We have people from Iraq. We have people from Canada coming. And so uh, I believe some people from Australia even came a few times. And it's a beautiful thing. People from all over America come into one area for a full week, and we have a religious, uh, spiritual you know, getaway, you could say, a conference, a true conference where there's Bible study in the mornings, prayers in the mornings, youth events, everyone from every all across the world, uh, Syrians come together. We have a great time and everyone's the same age. We all dress nice, sharp. Everyone there, this is funny thing that we call the CC, conference crush, where it's like, you know, oh, who's your conference crush? Is that, that guy, that girl. You get to know each other. Some relationships have sparked. Some marriages have sparked in these types of things. So it, it helps keep the Assyrian culture alive in terms of keeping people together. But the main purpose there is to praise and, and, and uh, learn more about Christ. It's not so much about relig uh, dating and all of that things. That's just a side benefit of it. But People look forward to events like that because they know they're going to be shoved in a room with three to four hundred, sometimes even seven hundred Assyrians, their same age, and they get a chance to talk to them and, and learn like, oh, who's compatible with me? Am I going to find my significant other here? That's in the back of everybody's minds, regardless of you know what the intent of the event is for. So I think that there is actually a greater struggle in the West uh, in terms of the North Americas for Assyrians. Mm -hmm. I think that they are struggling greatly finding a significant other. I think that uh, the selection of people that they have to choose from is greatly smaller than, and America is so big. It's so big. I don't think people understand how big America is. Roughly in Arizona, I, there was a consensus done where it was around twenty to 30,000 Assyrians live here, I believe. And in America itself, there's like 500,000, if that estimated Assyrians, which in America, there's 350 million people mm. in America. Mm. So we're not even like a percentage of the population. Mm. So if you just by just statistics, statistically finding your significant other, it's not going to happen if you're being purely off statistics because we're so spread apart because of how many other people are around us. And so you get watered down over time. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing. If you marry someone outside of the Assyrian culture, sometimes it just doesn't happen in the middle East back before Assyrians were, you know, exiled from their homelands. People were marrying other people, Arabs. I'm half, my mom's half Jordanian, half Assyrian. I'm part Armenian. I have Armenian blood in me. I have Jordanian blood in me. I like to call myself a Middle Eastern mutt. So it was a normal thing even back then, you know, so I don't necessarily think it was a horrible thing that, um, you know, to marry a non-Assyrian. I do think it's an important thing to continue with our populations. That's why I bring it up. I think that's a, a issue Americans are having. I'm very glad to hear that Australian Assyrians are not having this issue. Maybe we should all visit Australia once a year or something to, you know, find our significant other for those of us that are struggling. But I want to uh, get your perspective on something else. What are some impactful activities the Assyrians in Australia are doing in their communities? What can you tell me about that right now? What we do and where we do it is based off the church community. I take it back to something that one of my friends who runs his own business, uh, drumming and um, 
doing the Zorna, his name's Ashur Kings, they do the entertainment. And he said something to me, he goes, bro, I really, you know, his name's Manny, he's an incredible guy. Uh, one of my mentors, we, I've spoken to him, I like him a yeah, lot. He's, he's yeah, he's a really good guy. Manny and I go way back. And he said to me, he goes, bro, like, what do you think like draws us in all together? I was like, bro, whether you're A, your B, your C, your D, I think for us, like for us, we just love music. We love to dance. We love like that, like we love, we enjoy entertainment. And I really, like, it makes me happy when I see entertainers, singers, performers come to Australia, come to Sydney, because it doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, you're going. You want to see this person. You want to see that person. And I think that that's important to keep us going because you're going to come across an Assyrian male. You're going to come across an Assyrian female on table 22 who's wearing a red dress or was wearing a black tie that you like. That's one. Two, the other thing is hand in hand with entertainment um, is our faith, which, which is what brings us closer together. Uh, fortunately, some churches here and some communities here have um, small chapels, if you like, out in bush, in the bush. So it might be a monthly thing or a, or a quarterly thing where we, everyone jumps on a bus and you head over to one of the churches and we have a picnic day. About two months ago, we had one of the biggest um, like stall events. It was huge. We had jumping castles. We had stalls. We had food. We had drone shots. We had everything. It was incredible, right? And it brought all the Assyrians together. Um, look, the Assyrians in uh, in Australia are doing um, Bible studies. Um, our, our church started off with like four or five people in this Bible studies group three years ago. And now there's over 70 or 80 every Friday night. Man, it's, it, it's so incredible Beautiful. to see. So it comes back to your faith. Uh, we have events like... Uh, like gala days where we, well, it's just picnics and stalls and it's Assyrian groups and businesses and communities and we're supporting each other. Uh, we have comedy events. Um, we have singers that come out. Uh, we have the Assyrian fest. We have the Assyrian New Year's, which is also coming up. So we do, we do things. Do I think we do enough? Yes, ish. Can we do more? Absolutely. So yeah, I think I think the Assyrians right. are doing a gr a good job. Can we do better? Yes. Am I responsible for it? Yes. How can you do better? Um, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm starting very, very, uh, I don't want to say small because not really. I guess my first first comedy gig was I started with Ramina Raiden. And I, th I don't think that was small. I mean, Ramina is an incredible, talented uh, woman who, who really draws in uh, all types of Middle Eastern cultures together. And when she came here, bro, we did, we, we planned to do four shows or five shows. We ended up doing seven shows. Right, purely, purely based off uh, the number of people that wanted to come to the show, demand. People just wanted to see her, and that's an example of what we do. And I think the way that I'm responsible for it, not only am I responsible for it by being present and showing myself and being supportive um, as a host, but also, um, or as a host as an MC, but also as an act, putting myself out there. Man, when I did Ramina Raid it, I mean, people, uh, Ramina said to me, Johnson, I can't believe you haven't done your own comedy gig yourself because I'm so surprised. She goes, you, I mean, I only met Ramina for the first time was the first day. We meshed instantly and I'm hosting her show. I've got a 20 minute segment at the start of her show before she comes on. And I've got to make people laugh and loosen up before they, before they start. And I think I did a fantastic job at it. But yeah, I think I'm responsible for it in participating, in being there, in being present, but also sharing it on my socials. Why haven't you started your own comedy show or something of that form? Uh, good question. I'm lazy. I'm actually not lazy. I'm so driven. And I say I'm lazy because, you know, I, I, I work 14 hours a day. I come home, I go to the gym, I come home, I'm on the computer trying to find the next property so I can buy so I can. And then on the weekends, I try and spend time with my family. So then do this, bro, I'm a hundred miles an hour. Do I want to do it? Absolutely. Do I think I can? Absolutely. Maybe this is the start. Maybe you've start. you've single-handedly started something. Well, I think it's also the art of procrastination in terms of, you know, like you have so much going on. Oh, I can push this on to another day. But listen, man, I think Australia is lacking in um, a lot of people with social media presence. And I think you'd be one of the perfect people to fill that in. And I would begrudgingly advocate for you to start, especially with all the resources that you have at your disposal and the tight knit community that you have. I think that your voice is important on that side of the world and you should absolutely start small if that's all you can take care of and then move your way up when you can. Cause I think that you would be a success in doing so. And also the community would be behind you if you did. 
Aziza, bro, I appreciate that so much. I think that's what I needed. Honest, honestly, I think that's what I needed. I think aside from the fact that you just sit, like not just sit, you sit and you ask the hard hitting questions, you're also quite motivating. And I don't think that people understand how motivating that one comment actually might be. I appreciate that. And I try to as much as I possibly can to bring up people within our community because I think it's more important to bring people up regardless of what they're doing. Some people think that they're going to take the piece of the pie from you, right? Mm. But if you're really truly that good, you never have to fear about people taking the piece of the pie from you. Mm. That's something that we have to work at as a people as well is that we have a very limited mindset in terms of who's allowed to succeed within our community and who's allowed, who's allowed not to succeed. Yeah. So um, I'll prop everybody up because the true winners will win just because they'll speak for themselves. And I'm not afraid to let someone outshine me that means that they deserve the spot better than i do mm. but um just for to wrap things up a bit mm -hmm. why do you think there's an uptick in the amount of assyrian social content creators is the market becoming saturated or do we not have enough we never have enough why limit why limit why put a limit to the amount of exposure and content creation for the assyrian community saturation is someone's i mean you said it right i mean Yes, it could be saturated, but in the but at the same time, why not? Like I might have a follower that you don't have, and you'll have a follower that I don't have. So if I don't share it, I've lost the opportunity to share that information with somebody, right? I've got a group of friends. You have a group of friends. It's I don't think that there is enough. Like I think the Assyrian content creators do an incredible job. And I think that needs, there needs to be more out there. And I'm with you when I say when I want to promote and encourage every Assyrian to get out there and promote. I mean, whether you're a content creator or not, I mean, just get out there and, and, and spread the word of Assyrians. However, I still think that there's room to grow. I mean, you look at, you look at um, I have a couple of friends who are not Assyrian. I have a handful of friends who are not Assyrian, but who are incredible content creators who are Lebanese, who are Egyptian, who are Syrian, and they're incredible. And they didn't stop themselves from you know, growing or achieving what they want to achieve just because there's another one in Melbourne or there's another one in Victoria or, or there's another one in, um, or in Queensland. It doesn't like, no, that shouldn't exactly like you said, if you're, you're, you're your own destiny. And if you're going to succeed, you are because of who you are, what you say and what you do, because you're talented and you can do it. So no, I don't think it's too, I, I don't think it's saturated. Will it get saturated? Probably. I think there's so much more room to grow so much more room. I, I, yeah, and I think that um, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm encouraging of it. And I think that particularly in Australia, I agree with you. There's not, there's not many, if any. I mean, I've got one of my cousins, he's, uh, you know, he's my own blood, uh, Naramsen, who does all the mashups. He, he's incredible. He's done mashups with. Um, oh, he's amazing. He's amazing. Yeah. I've reached out to him. Yeah. Uh, we've spoken. He's. I love his with Juliana Gen. Juliana uh, yeah, Jindor, Juliana Sonia Adisho. He's got and uh, Sonia Adisho. Yeah, they're amazing. He's, amazing. he's got incredible mashups, right? Um, and I think that not many people like. I think that we need to really push that out there. I mean, there was. Um, he said something to me the other day, and he was like, "Bro, do you think that there'll be more of us now that like?" I said, "Yeah, absolutely." I said, "I hope." I hope and I pray that more Assyrians go out there, particularly in Sydney and in Australia. What would you like to see for the Assyrians' future? What's something within the next five to ten years do you think that Assyrians should be able to accomplish? Or what should they aim to accomplish? I know and I fear the day that I'll never be able to see the Assyrians fully unite, fully go back to our hometown. And I made this joke, and I made this joke to, um, uh, to Ramina. Ramina made it at one of the comedy festivals. She was hilarious. She goes, Imagine we all, all the Assyrians, with Jurut Khomale, or Parra, or Yelchiat, or Sepe, or Kupale, we all go together to just Iraq, or Syria, or Iran, or wherever from, just go, Bro, this is it. This is us. I get quite emotional about it because, I mean, Assyrians don't have somewhere where we can absolutely go and govern. And call it our own and i pray and i have faith that one day that'll happen i won't see it i don't think i'll see it what's stopping us i think what's stopping us is a handful of things i think what's encouraging i'll start with the good stuff the good stuff i think it's people like you i think it's people like george janko patrick Pitt david i think it's people who have a platform and talk about the assyrians and who are well spoken who are able to speak their minds uh, who are calculated, who can evaluate, 
who can make decisions based off information that's logical and valuable to the progression. You know where I'm getting at. We need to remove emotion, and it's hard to do. You've got to accept the past before you move forward. This country, Australia, accepted the past and apologised to what the British did to the Indigenous Aboriginals before we were able to move forward. There was no formal recognition or apology before they moved forward, and that's that's what needed to happen. And in and the Labor government, which is the effectively the democratic government, if we convert Labor and Liberals to Democratic and Republican, the, uh, the Labor government apologised. And they said, we're ready to move on. We're ready to move on with... Uh, with, with who the Indigenous are and, and what they've brought. I think that, you know, those those who have the platforms need to not be... Um, say what they need to say, but don't uh, cause divide or create prashta, as we call it in Assyrian. Um, not uh, choose sides. Bro, that's going to be the reason why people don't want to you know, go here or go there and support our community. That's going to be one of the many reasons. You know what I mean? And uh, and you'll see that. You'll hear that. You've got you've got people arguing with each other who have uh, platforms. Bro, Assyrian social content creators, all the Assyrian social content creators who have reached out to me, the laymen like me and you, are so supportive of it, um, we're, we're so supportive of each other. And I'm sure Patrick B. David is with George Janko, and I'm sure they've got that same relationship and with other Assyrians who have the same level and um, and capacity of influence. But you've got to be supportive, you know? And I think that Assyrians are so great and we're incredible at supporting. We're relentless. We're, 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 we're very passionate. But at the same time, we use that passion and we use that, you know, relentless behavior. And unfortunately, we have, we have distaste. We have sour. We have bitterness. Mm -hmm. And it's sad and it's almost disgusting, personally. And I'm very passionate about it because you and I, we want to see that um, we want to see that flag usher behind you somewhere one day, bro. I've been to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, bro. I sat in the room with the Tula Masters, bro. I sat there, but I was crying. My mate was like, bro, they're just statues. Like my mate, one of my best friends who I've known for years, was like, bro, they're just statues. And then he realized, like, bro, this is this is your life, right? This is who you are. I'm a Syrian. I speak a Syrian. I go to Syrian school. They, uh, like I'm very passionate, and you, and you can probably hear it in, in my voice and tone. And but I think that we're not we're, we're not there. We're not. There. We're nowhere near there. We're getting there. And I think and I think it's people like you and I and 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 and, and the and the greater community that that want to do the right thing. But are we doing the right thing? I mean, I ask you. Do you feel the same way? I'd I'd, I'd like to ask you that same question. Do you feel like the you and I's of the world are, are doing the right thing? by trying to unite, congregate, uh, pull together all the Assyrians, that one day we may be able to be one nation under whatever title, agreement, governing body it might be? Or do you feel like we're doing the contrary, the opposite? I'll say this. We have survived genocides. We have survived massacres. We have survived wars. We've survived losing a country. We've survived ISIS. None of those things... Not a single one that I just mentioned will be the end of Assyrians. What will be the end of Assyrians will be Assyrians themselves by being divided. The only reason Assyrians will not succeed in this world is because of the ego that we have as a people, then the disdain that we have for each other, for the ones that are succeeding and the ones who you do not agree with fully. We have in every aspect divided ourselves and the enemy has succeeded consistently no matter what the topic we speak about is we have always having counterpoints and opposite viewpoints to the point of contention where we cannot respectfully agree and move on every single thing is life and death when it comes to assyrians because emotions are high mm. so no isis will not be the death of us genocides will not be the death of us the Armenian genocide specifically would not be the death of us. The Kurds would not be the death of us. No things would be the death of Assyrians besides the Assyrians themselves. And the only way to stop that is by unification. I think we are the generation that does that specifically because we are able to broadcast the message politely, intellectually, shout out, and <laughs> coherently because before... The means of communication were so little, it was easy to divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. That's why we ended up being where we are today, regardless of your political beliefs. So one side plays one way, the other side plays another. We can't agree sometimes that the sky is blue <laughs> because the enemy has split us in half and told one side the sky is red. So with messages like this and being able to 
put your ego aside and leading by example, I completely think that we're heading in the right direction. I think we just started taking steps in the right direction. And that's why I emphasize to you to go harder on social media, to build, build a bigger influence on social media, to be a bigger voice in Australia for our people. Because guess what, man? There are doors and rooms that are going to be filled with some of the most influential Assyrians one day mm -hmm. talking. Mm -hmm. There's going to be Assyrians in that room who come from the liberal side and some come from the conservative viewpoints. Some come from an extremely Iraqi background and some from come from an extremely Syrian or Iranian background. You're going to have different perspectives in life. And it, that's every single category of being a human being. Gender, sexuality, whatever it may be. There's no room to leave anybody out, anyone's opinions, anyone's perspective. Because you don't know what you don't know until you know it. So maybe that person who you don't agree with has an amazing idea that you were never able to consider because you never sat down and had that conversation with that person. You don't know that person that you hate. <laughs> yeah. Because if you really truly knew a person on the, on the human level, you wouldn't hate them. Mm -hmm. You'd understand that they're a human being like you trying to figure it out. We're all living life for the first time, right? And so we're all figuring it out for the first time. Um, with that said, I do think we're in the stages of setting a foundation. I think we're in the stages of where our children and grandchildren, if led correctly, would be able to make the major changes that we hope to see one day. I don't know if it'll be us exactly, but I think we are the foundation of it. Yeah. With that, Johnson, I've taken a lot of your time. I appreciate you for making the time. Thank you so much. Um, love from America. And I hope that we can connect in the future again, my brother. You're an absolute gentleman. Aziza, I love your love from down under. We love you. We love your work. Thank you so much for having me. God bless. You're a gentleman.